with that, uh, I just wanted to give a really brief introduction on Mark. <clears throat> So he is a university reader and honorary consultant in the Department of Medical Genetics at Cambridge. He he's uh, trained in both medical oncology and medical genetics and uh, doctorally trained, focused on the role of mutations in Fanconi anemia genes. Again, I think many of you know already that uh, when we think of PALB2, Mark Tishkowitz probably comes to the top of our mind in terms of the world expert in PAL B2. So we're really excited to have um, him be present for this case conference and uh, give us some highlights about uh, PAL B2 associated risks and other um, items. And then he will be available as we talk through our cases to provide his expert guidance as well. So with that, I wanted to turn it over to Mark to uh, Go ahead and present. All right, Dr. Tishkowitz, we'll navigate for you. You're ready. Okay. Thank, thank you very much to you for that very generous introduction. Very kind of you. And thank you for allowing me to present today. So I will be focusing on the paper that we've just published. So I'm ready to go through the details with you of that and importantly, how, you know, what the implications are for clinical practice. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this work uh, comes out of the PALB2 interest group, um, which is a loose organization of about uh, 200 individuals. Uh, many of you may, put, may be part of that group. And we have a, a website that's uh, very useful, certainly useful for patients um, who contact us or mutation carriers who contact us uh, with queries through that and also um, are happy to be involved in our, in our work. Next slide. So I'm just going to run through what we do. So the core activity has been refining penetrance, uh, other cancers, and developing risk prediction models. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, next. Um, we've also been involved with um, database curation. And we have an LOVD database, which is actually a little bit out of date at the moment. So it was quite good a few years ago, but it has been superseded a bit um, by uh, well, certainly um, by ClinVar and um, by, so that's something that we need to do some work on, basically. We've also done a lot of work on breast tumors, uh, particularly with Georges Rees Fio at Memorial, and um, that work uh, continues. Uh, we're part of the H, uh, part of the ClinGen organization, uh, so we've been uh, heavily involved with the, um, using the ACMG criteria for VUS classification. Several members of our group are experts on functional work, uh, including Robbie Binkrist, um, Fergus Couch, and Bing, Bing Zia. And uh, as Tia mentioned, um, you know, prospective clinical studies have become an important aspect of our, to improve our understanding of PALB2. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the new paper. So this is this is the last paper that we published in 2014, and at the time that was the biggest study. That was 154 families, multi-center, both selected and unselected, and we firmly established at that point that PALB, you know, women with PALB2 mutations are at higher risk of developing breast cancer, and that was a bit of a landmark paper because before that there had been lots of small papers um, with very varied estimates for the risk and this this really brought everything together and um i, I relied heavily on the ant on the expertise of uh antonis Antonio and doug easton to help with the statistical analysis for this um but it really put power b2 on the map next slide so and the paper that we've just published in december is uh, an extension of that essentially so now we've gone from 154 families to 524. next slide and one of the key points in both papers is the critical aspect of getting the ascertainment right. So we have ascertained PALB2 carriers through both families. So uh, centers who've done mutation screening in families of multiple affected individuals. Um, and here we have to do quite significant ascertainment adjustment, otherwise you bias the results. So we, we actually look at each family individually and um, did break down the family to remove as much as we can, data that would have led to them being um, or them being tested in the first place. Um, 
so we don't rely on the probe. So the best families that we have are not those where only one person's been tested. The best ones are the ones where we have multiple affected um, and unaffected family members who've all had testing and they're the most informative families. So we give those a lot of weight. We also have a, sec a, a population based ascertainment. So these are usually through studies of uh, where Power B2 has been part of a panel on unselected breast cancer cases. And we combine the data from both of these sources. And this is what we had in our latest paper. Um, so pay families were eligible if they had one case with a cancer of interest. And, if, and importantly, if there was more information apart from the ascertainment part. So in fact, at the time, we, we probably had about 785 families altogether, but we had to exclude quite a few because there was only one case or they weren't informative or they weren't contributory to, the, uh, to this work. We ended up with 524 which 363 were family-based. You can see on the table below um, that uh, many of them only had um, you know, one or two mutations. That was the vast majority, as you'd expect. Um, but then you know, there were some much larger families that were very informative. And we had 161 population-based uh, cases as well. Next slide. So we then looked at different models. Um, you know, once we've once we've done all the the quality control and the cleaning of the data, and often we we it's a quite a laborious process. So we often contact you know some of you may have been contacted by us uh, for clarifications on on you know regarding data. Um, so once we've done all that work, we then look at the probability of each developing you know of each cancer being developed depending on the genotype. And we use different types of risk models to see which ones provide the best fit. And we also look at um, how the polygenic model would fit in with risk estimation. Next slide. And these are the latest results from, from this paper. So you can see that the overall relative risk is about um, sevenfold approximately. And we've got nice strong um, you know, statistical values for that. Uh, and you can also see that the relative risk declines uh, with increasing age. Uh, so th that's quite an important point to to realise, and that reflects that. We also see that in other genes as well. And here we show that information in graphical form. So the risk for an average Power B2 carrier um, by the age of 50 is about 17% lifetime risk, and uh, by the age of 80 is about 55% um, uh, lifetime risk with the confidence intervals that are now beginning to become quite narrow and they're quite you know from a clinical point of view these are quite useful confidence intervals now importantly we we may we base all this on a specific cohort of age age group and women and i'll i'll explain that a bit further in the, in the next slides so we also looked at the impact of family history according to um and and on top of um, power b2 mutation status so if you look at these curves you look at the blue line uh, the second one from the bottom that is uh, where you know we don't take any family history into account so that is your average power b2 carrier that's just walking off the street where you don't know anything about them they've got a mutation that's the risk that you would use and then if you go up uh, the darker green uh, one is someone whose mother had breast cancer at 50 maternal grandmother at 50 as well the olive green one slightly above that is someone whose mother had breast cancer at 35 and then the red one up there with the lifetime risk uh, approaching 75 percent is with a mother of breast cancer at 50 and a sister of breast cancer at 50 so two first degree relatives with breast cancers at 50 and the purple line at the bottom is actually when there's no family history so you can see that drops the um that drops the risk a little bit but not very much next slide so the cohort effect is interesting um, and we illustrated this here with this graph so it's clear that if you compare uh, women who are born before the age of 1940 compared to those born in 1970 or after there's quite a significant difference in relative risk so a fourfold difference and um, you can see this on the graph the bottom line in blue shows all the um, shows the risk for someone who was born in 1930 to 1939 and you can compare that to the top the top graph which starts off in uh, a sort of brownie reddy color then goes to a purple color because some of it's observed and some of it's predicted and you can see that the, the, the large difference in risk depending on year of birth so I think that is an important factor to take into account when you are seeing uh, 
someone who's got a mutation carrier and clearly someone some of the younger women that we see now in our clinics for predictive testing will, will have risks at that higher level uh, compared to their mothers or grandmothers next slide Uh, one question that I get asked a lot is how do you use a, a negative predictive result in a clinical setting? And we had looked at this a few years ago um, by, uh, by doing some modeling. Firstly, we just drew out the penetrance figures the, for the average average penetrance. And you can see we've here the top line is BRCA1 risk, lifetime risk for someone who's got a mutation, then BRCA2, then PALB2. Then um, after that, it is uh, checked to an ATM together. And after that, it's uh, untested or mutation negative. Next slide. So if you use that data, if you take, this is a family, a simple family where um, someone is uh, having a predictive test at the age of 20 and their, um, uh, their sister and their mother are both affected with breast cancer at 50. And the graph on the, on the, on the right-hand side shows you what difference the the risk makes in in the um, if you if that woman has not got the mutation essentially so you can see it's almost the inverse of the graph I showed you on the previous slide well it is the inverse so you start off with um, you know if there's only um, if if uh, no one's been tested or if there's family history only those would that's not going to make any difference but then if you go the next uh, lines down the um, the blue line there um, and the the purple line very close together the third lines down on that graph are the ATM in check two and you can see that makes a very little so if you have if this was a check two an ATM family and you tested that woman it would make very little, little difference to her breast cancer risk if she didn't have the mutation which we did expect because they don't have because it's not very penetrant those aren't very penetrant genes and then the next line down in dark blue in the middle there is the PALB2 then BRCA2 and then BRCA1, and then you get down to population risk. So you can see that, you know, in a BRCA1 family, by the time you, if you do a negative predictive test, their, their risk goes down to almost population level. So this really just reflects the penetrance of the gene. Next. Mark, you kind of froze for a second, so we lost you. So what were you saying exactly? So with PELB2, because I think this is, you're absolutely yeah. right, this is very important. So you so, have so, a PELB2. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, what I'm saying is that PALB2 falls in the, you know, the most useful negative predictive test is for BRCA1 and BRCA2. It's the inverse of the penetrance. So the most useful negative predictive test is for this highly penetrant gene. Then PALB2 is after that. And CHECK2 and ATM really aren't very useful. And, you know, if a woman has a, no mutation, but there, is a fa you know, but there is a mutation in the family, then that has very little influence on her breast cancer risk. Mm. And this bottom one is exactly you know, is, is the same thing, but with a weaker family history. And there you can see, you know, the curves are, the curves are nearer together because the effect is is less essentially. But it's still the same order of genes that you know BRCA1 makes the biggest difference. So um, a lot of this work is has been incorporated into a tool called CanRisk, and I hope I hope you've all been uh, made aware of this by now. If not, then here's the opportunity. This is the this is the successor to Bodicea, and it's vastly improved. We've, we've spent a lot of time and effort making this user friendly. Many of you who are familiar with Bodicea found you know it's it's a it's a, it's a very good tool to give um, results and an analysis, but it's pretty it was very unuser friendly. So we've developed this tool to actually use. Um, the back end of it is still Bodicea, the Bodicea algorithms, but the front end is, is much easier to use. You can upload pedigrees from other sources, and it also includes um, PALB2, ATM, and CHECK2. And uh, if you want to register, you need to register for this, just as you did with Bodicea, and there's the, the website is, is given there. So you can, con you can, through that website, you can register to use it, and it's pretty, so it's pretty intuitive. So please go ahead and use this for your risk predictions. Okay, coming back to the paper. Um, so, probably the the more the one of the sort of key findings, apart from breast cancer, was the risk for ovarian cancer. This has been queried for quite a time. It's been very hard to prove one way or another, and the reason for that is that the risk seems to be fr pretty modest. I would say. So we found there that you know if you have a PALB2 mutation, your risk is about threefold increase compared to the general population, uh, with confidence intervals that are still quite wide. Next slide. 
and this shows you the risk um, graphically and you can see that actually the risk to age 50 so you know to the menopause is is not even one percent so I think one can be fairly safe in not having to recommend a risk reducing nephrectomy before the age of menopause in power v2 carriers beyond that I think it's there's there'd be some debate because you can see the, cu the curve comes out at five percent which is really I mean, in the UK threshold is 10% for risk-reducing nephrectomy, and um, you know we we can consider it at 5%, but you know you can see the confidence intervals are quite wide there. So I think we still need to be cautious about this approach in PALB2. Certainly, there's no argument for doing nephrectomies in a premenopausal woman. So it's more like the BRCA2 situation compared to BRCA1. Next slide. Again, we've uh, modelled ovarian cancer risk according to family history, and if you include, if there is a family history of ovarian cancer, then the risk can go up quite considerably, as one would expect, because uh, ovarian cancer has quite a strong impact on family history. Uh, so, you know, in the severe, you know, the extreme example of in, in, in the red at the top, where the mother had ovarian cancer at 50 and the sister had ovarian cancer at 50, then yes, you can go up to a 15% lifetime risk, but you probably wouldn't be off far that you wouldn't you'd be near that anyway, regardless of whether or not you had a mutation, just based on family history. So I think one, you know, if there is a family history of ovarian cancer, it does make these decisions easier. Next slide. And we also looked at other cancers. So we've known for a while that um, PALB2 mutations crop up in pancreatic cancer families, but we didn't know what the actual risk, lifetime risk was. So here we've um, identified this at around uh, to in around 2%, so pretty modest. We've also found the um, male breast cancer risk to be increased, but again, the absolute risk will be very small. No increased risk for prostate cancer or colon cancer, and no overall increased risk in, in other cancers, but we, you know, there are ascertainment issues for these other things. Certainly, I think colon cancer, um, you know, or I think in prostate cancer are reasonable we, we would have picked something up because they're quite common. Other cancers, it's difficult to know, really. Um, so, if, you know, if there was a low, you know, if there was a particularly unusual cancer that occurred ra rarely in PALB2 but was associated with it, we would not have picked this up in this study. Next slide. So again, here we're just showing these same figures, uh, the, the same data in, in graphical format. Male and female pancreatic cancer, pretty similar risk. Important to look at the absolute risk on the on the left hand side there. So uh, you know we're, we're looking at about two percent lifetime risk, and then for uh, the male breast cancer risk, um, you know about one percent lifetime risk, up to, with a range uh, with a quite a wide, wide confidence range there. Next slide. So the conclusions are that PALB2 mutations are significantly associated with a high risk of breast cancer. I think we've proven that beyond reasonable doubt with this paper following on from our previous one. Uh, the relative risk decreases with the age of the woman, but it does increase significantly with the birth cohort. So when if she was more born more recently, then she has associated with a higher risk. We've now confirmed associations with ovarian, pancreatic and male breast cancer, but we did not see associations with colon or prostate cancer. Next. And I think the key sort of the key messages are really there isn't a BRCA3, but if you're looking for one, then, then PALB2 would be the best candidate, but it would be a long way third. You know, it's a distant third compared to BRCA1 and 2. And I also think we need to move away from the term moderate risk for this gene and also for the other genes. I don't think the, these ter the terms of high and moderate are very helpful because, as I showed you with the family history side of things, you can have a woman you know, who has a very high sort of BRCA equivalent level of uh, risk with, a, you know, if she's got a PALB2 mutation, uh, if she's got a high family history, and conversely, if her family history is not very strong, then that risk could be quite low. You also see that to some extent in ATM as well, and, it's, and there's some modification of CHECK2. So I think, you know, th these terms are being convenient, but I think they are confusing because there are definite overlaps. Next. Um, now, I'm not going to talk about this today, but I just wanted to highlight that there have been uh, three papers published recently about PALB2 variants of unknown significance, and uh, you know, we, could, we could go into these another time. These were all published towards the end of last year, and in fact, we, we ourselves published the first PALB2 um, pathogenic uh, missense variant. Um, this was a couple of years ago now in, in this family here, and um, you know, all, all the all the families that we included in the penetrance studies had clearly pathogenic truncating 
variants. We did not include any missed senses in, in our study at all. And it seems that when you look at, you know, when you look at these papers, there is, um, you know, the, there are a few missed senses that are probably pathogenic, but the, the, it's a small proportion. So it's probably a bit similar to what you see in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Next slide. And just to update, so this is, so that paper was based on 524 families. And as of October, 2019, we now have uh, over 1,300 families because we got a large number from GeneDx fairly recently. This is after we've done all the analysis. And um, so we've got uh, over 835 breast cancer cases, 42 ovarian and 24 pancreatic cancer cases, uh, over 50 collaborating groups. I've listed the top 10 centers there. It's very nice to see the iCare group there uh, firmly in second place. So thank you to all of you. Uh, for contributing families to uh, to our study. We really appreciate it. Uh, next slide. Uh, and these are just uh, some acknowledgements here. So we meet every year at the ASHG meeting. Our next meeting will be at the San Diego. We, it's usually an hour, an hour and a half meeting. Uh, this was the one in Houston. Uh, key people that I, that I need to acknowledge are uh, Zin Yang, Doug Eason, and Tony Santonio, all who are here in Cambridge who helped who, who did all this statistical analysis, which is quite complex and quite uh, not so easy to do. I've left my contact details there. Please feel free to contact me. There's the Power to uh, website and also the Canris website, which I do, uh, which I really would encourage you to register and use because uh, I think I think you'll be very impressed with it. I hope you will be, and give us feedback on that as well. And that's the end of my talk. Thank thank you very much.